This is CPSC 526-626, lecture number 9, on denial of service attacks. Denial of service, or DOS, attacks. This is an attack on availability. We've talked about confidentiality and integrity and authenticity, or as well availability. The CI and then the A is always a mix between the two possibilities. This is the availability aspect of security. That is, an attack where the attacker's goal is to disrupt the proper functioning of something. To an attack, the availability of a service. So that it runs out of capacity to service requests. It, the printer no longer has toner or paper and can therefore no longer be of use in print by an attacker who is able to, for instance, remotely print a whole lot of paper to some printer that's internet connected and has, a, for some reason, a global IP address that allows random people on the internet to print on it. The attacker in the setting may not benefit in a security sense. They don't learn what other people are printing but they benefit in the causing mayhem sense. A denial of service attacks thereby stops legitimate users from being able to access a service. It's an attack on the availability of a service or stopping a service from running. And there's lots of different reasons why attackers would do that, and we'll get into that. But first, why is denial of service hard? Part of it is that there's just an enormous attack surface. Basically, anything on the internet that can receive packets is at risk for a denial of service attack. There's only so many packets any computer can process at a particular, in, a, in a particular amount of time. And if you send more packets to a computer than it can handle, it will just stop processing packets. And anything connected to the internet is vulnerable to this kind of an attack, where you just consume all of its available bandwidth so that no legitimate traffic can get through. Here you can imagine from the printer analogy, we're talking about a web page. And if there's too many people downloading the web page at a particular moment in time, no one or many people's requests will not be able to be processed. And if the majority of those requests are not legitimate, are, are just people who aren't interested in actually viewing the website, but making it inaccessible, then most of the successful connections will go to those people who are not sincere in their request for that website. If I have 10 megabits per second that I can send out from my internet connection, and the server has 10 megabits per second that I can process, then I can just take it all. I can just consume the entirety of its bandwidth and no one else will be able to have any of their data processed. Denial of service is hard because there's no skill necessary. You can do this with a simple command on your computer. Attacks can come from anywhere. There's no technical challenge in mounting such an attack aside from the fact that most people's home internet connections are insufficient to actually take down a website. Where then we enter DDoS attacks, or distributed denial of service attacks. Now we have the combined pan bandwidth of a lot of machines. Here you can imagine thousands or millions of computers that are all simultaneously using what meager bandwidth they have so as to direct it towards one particular server and take it down. The distributed part comes from the fact that it's not one attacker, but rather many attackers. Or it could be one attacker who's leveraging many machines under their control or partially under their control. Maybe the attacker controls these machines, or maybe the attacker has some malware that's running on these machines that allow them to do this attack, or maybe the attacker has managed to convince these people to help them help the attacker in the attacker's cause, but this is the idea of a, denial, a distributed denial of service attack, or a DDoS, 
is that we have a lot of attackers simultaneously and coordinated targeting a victim machine. So let's look at the adversaries. Why do a denial of service attack? What is the motivation? And here it's useful to think back to the adversarial schema, this categorical schema of adversaries that we developed. Because there's reasons why organized crime would do a denial of service attack. There's reasons why foreign intelligence would do a denial of service attack. There's reasons why politically motivated attackers would do a denial of service attack. And they're all different. Or at least the sort of examples that come quickly to mind, they're all different. But they're all related to the same kind of attack, that they would want to take down some particular server so as to prevent it from being able to provide information. Or to take down some particular server so as to cause financial harm to who owns it. So let's look at their categorical schema. Foreign intelligence, terrorists, or politically motivated adversaries, industrial espionage agents, organized criminals, lesser criminals like script kiddies who are just found out about denial of service attacks and tried it out and saw that it worked, malicious insiders, non-malicious insiders and researchers, casual hackers and bug bounty hunters. So I encourage you to pause and think about denial of service attack, denial of service attacks that might exist and or that could exist and might be of interest to attackers within this schema. So in the closer to the realm of the script kitty example, we have someone who just wants to win at an online game and isn't talented enough to win by playing better, so he buys with his allowance money a botnet, or leases rather, so that he can ping flood another player and thereby beat them in a particular online game. Not the most... Uh, intense example of a denial of service having global impact, but nevertheless fits into the categorical schema. Here, it's even an available as an advertisement. Do you get annoyed all the time? Do you want to take down your competitors' servers or website? Well, we have a product for you. Take down your enemies at 30 cents for a 10-minute time period, and so on. So, a for-profit, for-sale botnet of denial of service for people who just want to get revenge. Criminals. Also notice that in the same sense that you can create a protection racket, you can create a protection against denial of service racket. Let's look at their advertising. Are you experiencing a denial of service attack? Your business is riding on the availability and integrity of your website and online services. Distributed denial of service attack could wreak financial havoc. Compromise your customers and damage your reputation. Pay us so we don't do this. Here is an example of a denial of service attack that is one step in a much more sophisticated and complicated attack. What was happening was people's stock trading accounts from TD and E-Trade were compromised, and the attackers were selling off their shares and sending the money to the attackers' accounts. Now, this might trigger an alert, such as, it's unusual behavior to suddenly start selling all of your shares and transferring it to an account that isn't in your name and that we've never heard of. And so TD might phone 
the victim with their their backup phone line and say, is this a suspicious transaction? And so the denial of service attack was to actually flood the victim's phone so that none of those phone calls could go through. And apparently not being able to reach the victim was enough for TD to say, ah, it must not be an attack after all. If you're familiar with the history of WikiLeaks, there was a moment which is also, this moment is tied with the, the first major rise in the value of Bitcoin. There was a moment where major commerce processors, such as Visa and MasterCard, PayPal, simply refused to process donations to WikiLeaks. And what's interesting about this, it was a unilateral decision. It wasn't a government decision saying WikiLeaks is a terrorist organization and they cannot be supported, but rather it was private companies deciding, ah, people spending their money this way shouldn't be allowed and forming a, a kind of censorship towards this particular transaction. And in retaliation, there was a massive denial of service attack that actually took down Visa.com which one would assume would have substantial resources in maintaining their availability. So this would be an example of a politically motivated denial of service attack by just volunteers contributing what they had. A survey done for those who maintain independent media or human rights sites reported having experienced denial of service attacks. So, again, politically motivated. You're running a website that may not speak highly of a country that doesn't have a very good human rights record. You might be attacked by that country by virtue of stating these pieces of information. An election, a municipal election in Korea, South Korea, saw that a um, uh, saw the personal assistant of the ruling Grand National Party politician as as a person of interest. I don't know the details of what finally happened uh, in this, but uh, seeing from the date, it is a decade ago. So I'm guessing that the the story has concluded at this point. But security experts at the time did not consider that this uh, assistant was the mastermind behind a denial of service attack against the National Elections Commission website. But there was interest as to whether or not this was a form of election interference and whether it was a form of election interference that was involved compensation. There was accusations against the Russian Federation for unleashing a cyber war campaign against Estonia. Estonia ha was positioning itself as a European member state, as being a tech-friendly place to work. They wanted to become a, a, a Silicon Valley within the European Union is also where Skype was from and now transfer wise and of course disruptions in your online capability when you're positioning yourself as a place to do online business of course will have a strong negative effect so here we have at least as alleged a state level interest in performing a denial of service attack There are two basic approaches to doing a denial of service attack. One through a program flaw and the other through resource exhaustion. And both are relevant in this setting of trying to take down a web server, for example, that you just want a service to become unavailable. Resource exhaustion is probably the one that's more obvious. Program flaw takes some talent and skill 
to find a program flaw and then exploit it correctly. Resource exhaustion is more like sending a lot of packets and having more packets than they can process. By analogy, a program flaw would be like trying to dereference null, the program seg faults, and with some luck, maybe the server shuts down, reboots, or something like that. The idea is to give input that crashes a server. Or if the server allows itself to be shut down remotely and doesn't authenticate those requests correctly, or you're able to fake those requests, you can convince it to shut down, and then maybe it has to be physically turned back on with a button. Denial of service via resource exhaustion, the best analogy would be a while one loop. It does nothing, but it doesn't halt, it just continues. It consumes CPU, it consumes memory, it consumes disk, it consumes network. And the idea of just sending more HTTP GET requests than it can handle, and using a d distributed denial of service so that there's far more than it can process, would be an example of this resource exhaustion. And both of these examples illustrate this reluctant allocation design principle. Ideally, a web server wouldn't serve its website to someone who had no interest in that website. But the web doesn't assess that when you're making a request, so there's no reliable way of determining, does this person really want to see the website, or are they one of the thousands of people or millions of people who are sending fake requests to take me offline? If you could reliably tell who were the legitimate interested part partners of seeing your website, you could just serve them. So, for instance, if you had to log in, and then you could service requests to those who were logged in. If they made too many requests, you could stop servicing them and service those who weren't issuing so many requests but were still authenticated in some way. This would be an example of reluctant allocation. That is, you don't expend resources first. You let the other person somehow prove that they are deserve these resources, and then you allocate them. For program flaws, defending against them requires careful programming, careful testing, and careful review. And for the shutdown example, careful authentication of incoming commands. If you can remotely control something, you're going to want to make sure that you know exactly who is controlling it. Defending against resource exhaustion, however, is really hard because defenders offer services. The entire idea of the web is that there's websites that you can go to, and you can go to them pseudo-anonymously, in a sense. You don't need to be logged in. Your IP address is still visible, but you're not registered. You're not proving that you're allowed to see this website. Anyone is allowed to see this website. It's only when everyone tries to see it at the same time that it can no longer handle those that volume of requests. The problem is that of isolation. You can't reliably separate the attacker's use of a website from legitimate users of that website. There's no way to say this all this traffic belongs to the attacker so let's not service it if you could reliably identify users then you could say well let's not handle the adversary's request but the problem with a distributed denial of service attack in particular is that it is indistinguishable from legitimate requests they're just people downloading the website at a particular moment in time. Some small fraction of them are legitimate, and the vast majority are part of a distributed denial of service attack. But how do you separate it if they're visiting you, all of them are visiting you for the first time? When you're performing a denial of service attack, in particular, this is for the resource exhaustion model. The goal is to exhaust the bottleneck link 
for the target's internet connection. That is, there is a website that you are trying to take down, and there is going to be some part of the internet where that website connects broadly that will, when you give it insufficient requests, will fill and no longer be able to handle requests. That is, all traffic to and from this target go through this link. Now, this bottleneck link is likely not going to be on the broad internet, but it might reside closer to the website itself, perhaps within the internal corporate network between the gateway of that website and the machine somewhere along the path. One of the on-path routers will be the bottleneck. And when that has reached capacity and there's no alternate route, there's no other way of sending your traffic, the only way through is to traverse this bottleneck, which is already at capacity. And here we have two approaches. The first is to use all of the bandwidth. And the idea here is to send maximum size packets. The idea is you want to consume all of the available resources. And in this case, that is network capacity. So the amount of bits that can travel into this router at a particular moment in time is maximal. No more bits can arrive. Packets further get dropped. The alternate is you overwhelm the rate that it processes packets. And here you send minimum size. Why? Because every packet that arrives involves looking at the IP header, taking the link layer header off, creating a new link layer header, routing that packet. And so if you send minimum size packets, you're going to in maximize the amount of per packet work that this router does. Now for a particular router, perhaps maximum size packets is what takes it down, perhaps minimum size packets takes it down. But those would be the two extreme approaches. One of the two will work better than the other. Now, how do you defend against a denial of service attack? Well, suppose that the attacker has access to a lot of bandwidth. Or simply the amount of traffic they can send you is more than you can handle. Well, one thing that you can do is filter out their traffic. You can recognize, hey, this IP address is sending me a lot of traffic. It's unlikely they want to view my main website a million times within a second. That doesn't seem like human behavior. So we'll remove all of their traffic. We'll filter it out. And we'll come back to this when we talk about firewalls. Firewalls are a technique to quickly filter packets based on their headers and remove them from consideration so that they don't cause these sorts of attacks. But what can go wrong here? What can go wrong in the setting where we just say, well, this IP is sending me too much traffic, I'm going to disregard it? First, the attacker can simply spoof an IP address. So just because someone is an attacker who's willing to break the law doesn't mean that they're going to have well-formed IP packets that are correctly identify them. They may just have IP packets that identify a random person. What can the attacker do here? Well, Effectively nothing. If there's a random IP every time and they all look like they could be coming from legitimate people who want to see your website, there's really not much you can do. Unless somehow there's some characteristic in the traffic that's conspicuous or the, the, the source IP addresses aren't random but sequential and you can detect a pattern. ISPs, those entities that allow normal people's access to the internet, 
they can see what the packet is because they know that the only way from your personal computer to the big wide internet is through their one piece of copper that connects them. They could actually look at every single source IP and say, is that actually your house sending this? And if not, disregard that traffic. However, as long as there's ISPs that don't do this, we'll have this attack. And there's no regulation that says ISPs must implement anti-spoofing mechanisms. Another flaw with filtering is that the attacker can use many machines to send the traffic. This is the distributed denial of service. It doesn't all need to come from the attacker's machine. And now the defender's filters become much more complicated. And they're going to be blocking normal people as well. Who might just happen to have malware on their computer and thereby be part of a botnet. As we saw with that ad, botnets exist. They can be rented out for DOS attacks. So this is not a, a hypothetical. And actually, there's, there's one more point I wanted to add, which is that a secondary flaw of this is that an attacker who wanted to, for instance, prevent a particular IP from being able to access a resource could make it look as though that IP was performing a denial of service attack. And by doing so, would effectively enact censorship against that IP. That the server would think, oh, this IP is, is sending me attack traffic, I won't service their requests, but that actual person had nothing to do with that attack traffic and later can no longer access this website. Here we have a plot of attack traffic for denial of service attacks from 2008 until 2017. And we see that there, there was a spike in the peak attack size in 2016 at 800 gigabits per second. And this corresponds to an actual discovered attack. Because it turns out that for these denial of service attacks, there's a way of amplifying your effect. It's no long it's not the case that the total amount of your traffic must exceed the total amount of the victim's traffic. But there's a way of using confused deputies, other people who are not aware that they're actually part of this attack, there's a way of using these confused deputies to help you mount your attack. This is called amplification, and we'll talk about this now. Denial of service amplification is where the attacker makes the victim use more bandwidth than the attacker. And this makes denial of service attacks easier, and it makes them cheaper. Security is hard because of these asymmetries. The attacker invests less work than the defender because they use confused deputies to help in their attack. So, the DNS DOS amplification. Now, we haven't covered DNS yet, but the protocol itself should be familiar from networks. DNS is a critical UDP protocol. It's the thing that translates google.com into an IP address. So when you type on your browser a domain name, you're not typing an IP address. But when you actually send out your HTTP GET, there's an IP address. And the reason you know it is because earlier you've done a DNS request. And we're going to go through DNS and attacks on DNS in the, in the, in the lecture soon to come. But... As it relates to denial of service, the crucial part of DNS is that DNS includes all of the information in the query, and then it adds more information, all of the answers. The query is, I want to go to google.com, what's its IP address? And the answer is, repeating that, I want to go to google.com, what's its IP address? And then adds, the IP address of google.com is blah, 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 blah. This means that it is by definition larger. 
the response is larger than the request. And DNS is critical infrastructure, meaning that it's available. It has resources behind it. It can handle many, many, many requests. So the idea of a DNS DOS amplification is that the attacker spoofs DNS requests as though it came from the victim. So if I want to take down a website, I send a request to the DNS server saying, this website wants to know what this IP address is for some hosting. And because it's UDP, there's no handshake as we see with the TCP protocol. You just need to send a packet out, the DNS server sends a packet back. Except when you send it out, you fake your source IP address, which means it's the victim that gets it. It doesn't matter if you're on path. You can do this entirely blind. You just send the packet to the DNS server. The DNS server sends a response to the victim because you told it that the victim was the one who requested this information. The victim never learns your IP address. You have this DNS server acting as the intermediary to this whole affair. And the victim can't disable DNS. It's critical infrastructure. It needs, the internet needs DNS to work. It turns out that the DNS, if you set your parameters right, gives you 100-fold amplification, meaning that for every byte you can send out, the DNS server will happily send 100-fold bytes to the victim. So if your capacity was one megabit per second, your victim receives a hundred megabits per second. And this is where we go back to this peak attack size. These are coming from clever uses of amplification, not the total volume of botnets. There's a protocol called NTP, the Network Time Protocol. If you use Wireshark, for any stretch of time, you'll find some NTP requests as well. NTP is happening all the time. NTP is the reason why your computer knows what time it is, even when daylight savings happens. And NTP is crucial because in protocols like Kerberos, there is a notion of time. And... If you don't know the correct notion of time, you might also be lied to about what time it actually is. And depending on the nature of your protocol, for instance, you might behave differently at a different point in time. You might accept some piece of information if you believed it was yesterday and do some bad behavior, even though... If you knew it was today, you wouldn't have done that. These are known as time-traveling attacks. But the NTP protocol is also UDP-based, and it also exhibits this amplification. And the amplification was never meant to be a form of a denial-of-service attack. It just happened to be a command you could run, which would produce a lot of information. There was nothing wrong with it. When you're designing a protocol, you support these features. If you send this request, you get this information. You send this request, you get this information. People who are de designing these protocols aren't thinking in terms of how might this be exploited for a denial of service attack later down. And this particular command, the monList command, caused the list of the last 600 IP addresses which connected to it to be sent to the victim. So 600 IP addresses, that's a lot more than the statement mon list. So it allowed for a 500-fold amplification for an attacker who was able to target this. This resulted in these network time protocol servers being patched, being repaired so that they would no longer do this because you cannot allow for, in UDP on today's internet, a request resulting in a 500-fold response simply because these denial-of-service attacks can exist. So the mere existence of these denial-of-service attacks means that we're not allowed to have protocols that behave this way. 
that a protocol that behaves this way is considered a security vulnerability. And there were publicly accessible network time protocols because it's useful. You can ask what time it is. You can bootstrap the time on your computer. But these, any of these services could be used in the attack. Finally, we have the memcache D DOS amplification. Memcache is a distributed memory cache. The idea is that clients store key value pairs. So it's like a hash table in a sense, or a, a, just a, a, a dictionary, a map. You have your key, you store a value, you keep the key, later you request the value because you have the key. And it's distributed, so different computers can use it. If you've ever done any kind of distributed programming, you can quickly realize how useful this could be and imagine the utility when this is universally accessible over the internet. You could just connect to the server, you have computers on different parts of the planet, but they can all access this memcache. It's a giant memory storage that works worldwide and you can store arbitrary blobs of data with a key. Well, what can go wrong? The value is larger than the key. So however larger the value is than the key, we have a DOS amplification. So what was the fix to the memcache D? Before we get to that, a peak at 1.3 terabits per second was the attack volume when the memcached DOS amplification was occurring. The map of this, the attacker, IP spoofed request to a large number of UDP servers. Memcached, you send the, you send the key via UDP. It sends the response to the victim because it's IP spoofed you get a huge amplification based on the disparity between the key size and the value size. So what was the fix? And incredibly, the fix was to disable UDP. Because TCP requires this three-way handshake, SYN, SYNAC, ACK. And that immediately puts off-path blind attackers at an enormous disadvantage. They don't know the SYN number anymore. So they can't actually inject any packets in stream. If you're a blind attacker, you have no idea what the correct SYN number is. All you can do is guess. There's way too many numbers to guess. And you lose your amplification benefit if you don't guess right. So incredibly... The solution, in a pragmatic sense, is don't use UDP. Because UDP allows for IP spoofing, and when you have IP spoofing, you can add an asymmetry between the size of a response and the size of a request, then the result is a DOS amplification attack that can occur. So in summary for this lecture, there's many adversaries that want to use DOS attacks. We visited, we looked at our categorical schema. We saw some examples of DOS attacks across the spectrum that were characteristics of different types of motivations. We can conclude that these attacks exist and they're not going away and that they're hard to stop. IP addresses hide the origin if you spoof them and there's no regulation that every IP address you put out there is the legitimate one coming from you. Botnets make it legitimate. It's, it's no longer that they're spoofed. There are just many people participating in this attack. But the main takeaway is that if you have a UDP protocol, 
with an asymmetry in the request reply, and you're available on the internet, you will be used to do a DOS amplification attack if you provide it as a service, whether or not you intend to or are doing it intentionally. 